to create safe spaces for trans and non-binary folks. So we have here with us Belen Jimenez, Fernanda Carles, and Kendra Albert. So I am going to ask you to present yourselves if you wanted to. In the uh, Belen, could you start, please? Yeah, no problem. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Belen. Uh, I'm from Asuncion, Paraguay, originally, but right now I am in Germany doing my master's in human computer interaction. And I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having this place, this space laid for us. On. Thank you very much, Bella. Uh, Fernanda? Yeah, sure. Well, my name is Fernanda. I'm a project coordinator here at uh, TEDIC. We're a, we're a digital rights organization in Paraguay, and I'm in charge of projects that have to do with gender, community, and technology. And well, I'm very excited to, to be here and to tell you a little bit more about my ex our experience, my experience working with um, uh, queer communities and trying to generate these safe spaces here in, in Paraguay and in the region. And finally, Kendra. Hi, everybody. I'm super thrilled to, to be here and be in conversation with, with folks. Um, my name is Kendra Albert, um, they, them pronouns. I'm an attorney at the Harvard Law School Cyber Law Clinic in the United States where I practice technology law. Um, and I uh, mostly work on mach adversarial machine learning uh, stuff sort of ethics and law and policy of adversarial machine learning, in addition to sort of thinking also about sort of trans inclusion and trans politics, mostly from a, a United States focused uh, lens. So I'm really excited to, to listen and learn to folks thinking about it from other, other places and spaces. Your mic is, is off, I think. Um, yeah. Juan. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> well, to start the conversation, well, uh, I would like to start with a simple question to everyone. Is what is for you a safe a, a space? Who want to go first? I'm going to let that to you. Or if you don't decide, I'm going to choose one. I can go first if that feels helpful to Okay. So I, I really am glad you're asking this question because I think it's such an interesting place to start. For me, I actually try not to talk about like safe spaces um, because I try to often use the phrase safer space. Because I think one of the things that like I've learned is that, you know, we can't promise anyone, all trans folks, all queer folks, you know, anybody uh, full safety. You know, there's always going to be access needs or support needs that might conflict with each other. You know, some the things that some folks find supportive and helpful might trigger other people. Right. So like. You know, and I think that's totally navigable, right? I'm not like saying like, oh my God, it's impossible and we should never even try, right? That's not not my point. But I think, so I think for me, I think about spaces, safer spaces of spaces that are really about intentionality, right? About like being very specific and thoughtful about how, how the spaces you're creating are gonna work, what the rules are and communicating them as much as possible in advance um, so that people can make like decisions that are right for them about how they want to choose to participate or what what kinds of spaces that they're able to be in in the moment. So all uh, that's that's sort of my first crack at an answer, but super excited to hear what other folks are thinking. Um, I think that I agree with you, Kendra, with that with that phrase that you use about safer spaces because I think that that's that's a reality. May, um, in many, many spaces that maybe I can consider a safe space for me, it's, it's not really safe for, for, other, for others. And at the same time, I, I just wanna mention that for me, a safe space is a space where I can take control of what I wanna share, how I wanna share it, who I wanna share it with. And for me, it's a lot about that. Yeah, about 
being being in control of what happens with your information, with your identity, and what kind of conversations are are going on in in the space. Like just being able to build that community that feels um, like everyone has a degree of control in in that in their personal the, the way that they express themselves. Yeah, I agree with both of you, and I would also say that a safe space for me. Uh, is one in which I can feel heard and protected as well. Uh, and in a space in which I might also show my identity if I want to, but also one in which I um, can inhabit without having to display information about me without my consent, right? Uh, to me, that's key, um, the, the aspect of consent. Um, that, would be, that would be it for me, I would say. Consent for me would be key. Um, and without the, a space that shouldn't really have this backdoor mechanisms um, or mechanisms that occur backdoor that threaten my privacy, my integrity, my identity, right? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I totally agree with you with the uh, safer places, uh, spaces. Um, actually, it goes perfectly with the second question that I'm going to make. Is from your experience, what do you think a uh, safer space? Uh, what, what do you think is a safer space? Uh, spaces for trans and non-binary people should be like. I, I think that I want to hear from, from Belen and Kendra first before I, I give my, my answer. But at the same time, I just want to okay. say that, that for me, it's like that, that question is, um, I don't know, it's, it's very, I think it's, it's kind of hard for me to, to answer because, well, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a cis woman, right? So for me, it's like, I think that most of the things that I know about safe spaces for trans and non-binary people are from conversations that I had with trans and non-binary people that kind of opened my eyes like they uh, to to what they need right so for me I think that um, building a, a space that the a safe space for, for trans and non-binary people should come from from what they have to say, from what they need, and should be. If I'm the person be trying, if I'm a person involved in building that space, I think that um, the inclusion of uh, these kinds of people in the design process of these spaces is very, is, is extremely important. It's it's completely necessary. So I think that that's that's something I I I, I would like to say to start, and I don't know if. Kendra and Belen want to say anything to, to follow this conversation? I can briefly just uh, add to that. I completely agree with you, Fer. And I, I do believe that uh, being like as a designer, you know, here in my, in the masters that I'm doing, what, what a designer does is basically an intervention. So as an intervention is what sort of aspects we need to take into account. And I think that, uh, within our field, we talk a lot about reflexivity. Basically, in our research, in every design intervention that we think of, is also the matter of thinking that who we are also shapes what we do. So, and there comes biases and also identities, like so many other factors, right? Uh, and I, I believe that we do need to take into account the different identities that come from it, and also a uh, safe space in that sense should be one that is accessible and it should also allow uh, for appropriation and participation in the making of it, right? Especially um, for trans and non-binary uh, folks, right? So I believe that a safe space should allow for the celebration of our identities and diversity in that sense, and also have some mechanisms as well for accountability in case that some instances of violence or threats uh, take place, right? because that's a reality we will never create a like a perfect uh, utopia or like a safe space for everyone right yeah 
Yeah, I think, um, I think that for me, like part of the, I guess it, it, in some ways it's easier to answer this question by thinking about like less safer spaces that I spend time with and like what's wrong with them. In some ways it's, you know, I think that sometimes like spending time in community with folks who have put the effort and time in is kind of like, you know, you like, it's like, you step it's like stepping into like a hot bath and then like when you get out of it you're like suddenly I'm so cold right I wasn't cold before I got in um but now I'm really cold right so I, I'm really torturing this metaphor here but you but I think that there are ways in which spaces make uh where safer spaces can make you sort of feel their absent the absence of these sort of forms of inclusion elsewhere and I think that for me the one of the ways I think about it is sort of like I think that oftentimes when folks are designing like these spaces, they sort of concentrate on like one moment, right? Or like one thing rather than sort of thinking about like what I, I you know, sort of more of a life cycle, right? So like I go to an event, right? And it's like, oh, great. Like, you know, they, they tell people to write pronouns on their name tags. Like, oh man, you know, excellent. This is like, and that can, you know, I'm I'm not knocking that because I think that can be a genuine form of, uh, you know, inclusion in particular in languages where that's like a helpful thing that folks are are doing. But like, you know, if I had, I've totally been to events that are like write your pronouns on your name tags, but like there are no gender neutral restrooms, right? Like that they got as far as like, yeah, uh, as far as like step one, which was like, ah, oh, this like slightly more like performative public thing, but they haven't really thought about it from the perspective of a non-binary person or a trans person who might actually wanna attend the whole event and like pee, right? So I think that like, for me, you know, thinking about like spaces where I feel safer are spaces where, you know, you started at the beginning that like moment of walking into the physical space, you also thought it through to the end rather than just sort of like being like I oh, we check the box and we're done right like we we put the pronouns on the name tag and we're good right I think the other thing I would say is that I think um I think one assumption that I see around building safer spaces for trans folks and queer and non-binary folks in the United States is at like um this sort of assumption like it sounds stupid when i say it this way but that trans folks are white right that spaces that are safe for white trans folks are safe for trans folks and that's not true right not spaces that aren't anti-racist aren't safe for trans folks because you know trans folks aren't just white and so, so i think that one thing i definitely have seen and one thing that makes like, I, I don't want a space to be safe for me, but not safe for like my siblings and like of color and my friends and my colleagues, right? Like that's not, like, that's not actually a safe space for me, right? Um, even if, uh, even if, you know, there are pronouns in the name tags. So I think that you can't just pick one axis and be like, okay, great, we're gonna work on this one and then we'll come back to the other ones, right? Because, the reality is, although of course there aren't, there isn't one trans community or one queer community or one non-binary community and one set of needs, there are, uh, but there are ways in which, you know, you wanna make it inclusive across, across a variety of different aspects simultaneously rather than sort of trying to like check things off. Anyway, that turned in, I'll, I'll stop there. I do think that for me, well, for me, a safe. Sp I was thinking about this question: What, what a, does uh, a safe space look looks for me? How does it look for me? And I think that something that a word that came to my mind was like a safe space is kind of invisible. Like you don't have to. Um, uh, with, with these things about pronouns, uh, you should write your pronoun. You should do this. You should do that. Uh, like. Here, here's a flag showing that we're we care. I think that those are, as as you said, I think that those things are important. They 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 do contribute to to like making the the, the space better. But at the same time, um, I do feel like maybe we're we're not like integrating these solutions in a way that feels uh, like seamless, like natural. And I think that that's a safe space should feel natural to to like natural and just uh, people should just be able to be there, not 
uh, not only think about their gender, but but their whole whole identity and just feel okay. And I think that that's that's an interesting thing that I think this uh, an interesting challenge for designers. And I want to hear what Belen has to say about it because she is a designer, and I want to hear her her opinion. Uh, actually, one thing that we've been talking a lot in my program is about what makes good technology, right? Uh, and one very important aspect is that good technology, in a way, is seamless, invisible, right? The same way you, Fernanda, have your glasses. You see the world through your glasses, but you do not think about your glasses all the time because it's so well designed that it's just a part of you. And you know that obstacle is taken, taken out. It's not like you go to, a, I'm just going to give a simple example, my might sound dumb, but like, it's not like you go to a conference and then someone approaches you, here are your glasses, because we know you can't see and you're different from the others. And you know what I mean? Uh, so you stop thinking about your glasses and you focus more on other stuff, right? Uh, so in a way, uh, I agree with what you said in the sense that these things, these actions that are being done should be um, also with what you uh, said, Kendra, like holistically done like through every step, but also they should be invisible. When they are invisible, when they are seamless, then there's a good job in there because then people don't have to think about that anymore. Can I disagree for like one brief moment? Um, I, you know, I, I love that vision and I think total, I like totally, yes, I'm not on team like here are your glasses at the beginning of the conference, right? But I think one thing technology can also do is like make the familiar unfamiliar, make the like the normal strange for people who don't think about it very often. And I think for me, like, I literally like, there's not a single interaction with a human that I don't already know that isn't a question. There aren't questions about gender for me, right? Like, you know, is this person gonna use their right pronouns? Are they gonna say something? silly like am I gonna be able to find out what their pronouns are to the extent that that's relevant right like you know this is sort of like an you know an ever present part of the negotiation of dealing with humans right uh for for me and I think for lots of trans folks right um you know whether it's being concerned about being clocked or like or like being uh, outed or you know there are people this cuts in a variety of different ways and so sometimes I'm like, I just want cis folks to experience gender the way I experience gender, right? Like, not uh, not um, necessarily like, oh God, like <laughs> maybe not all in all of the ways because I don't really necessarily feel like everyone needs to. But sometimes I think that the some of the technologies that we build around non-binary folks and around trans folks actually are around creating those experiences for experiences for cis folks that trans and non-binary people feel all the time and I think that like that can be an important sort of element of the conversation around like what space how do we think about spaces and safer spaces because I think sometimes you know if I'm going to say something mildly controversial sometimes I think that like making spaces safer for folks who are minoritized, for trans folks, non-binary folks, especially trans and non-binary folks of color, can mean sometimes making them feel less safe for folks who have historically been in the majority and who feel very comfortable in those spaces, just kind of saying whatever's on their mind or like, you know, doing things that make other folks feel excluded. And I don't, I don't think it's actually in practice a zero sum game, right? And I do think that, you know, there are ways to make these technologies and these experiences invisible and like seamless. But, you know, sometimes I, you know, I wanna think about who it's seamless for, right? Is it, you know, is it seamless for, you know, the folks who've always been in the spaces or is it seamless for folks who are maybe joining for the first time who traditionally don't feel like included or welcome? Yeah, that's, yeah sorry for. I, yeah, I just wanna, um, I do, I do think that you, you make a very interesting point and I do kind of agree with what you're saying in a way, but I just want to say, do you believe that there's a way that like in a, in a, in a, in a future, like there's a way to just kind of integrate those two ways, like a sense of seamlessness, but at the same time, uh, a, a way of recognition for 
diversity and how do you think that that should look like from your experience? I, I mean, I can't, I want to hear what, I can, I'll go briefly and then I want to hear what Bowen okay. has to say. Yeah, okay. I think, okay. oh, or unless, do we want to move on? I don't want to. No, uh, actually one of the questions about that, that I'm going to make is about that because where I'm going to share an experience that I have a few years ago uh, when I was the part of the design team on an application for that actually want to make safer places for trans people. Oops. Ah, there, this, I'm back. <laughs> uh, for trans people and the thing that we started to ask at the beginning I see that most of the team were six people and just was the only non-binary person there. And the, uh, and the idea of safety, of safety it was quite particular and doesn't correspond what, the, what was the, or what was the idea of trans people. So, so what was the idea of safe space for a trans people? And so, and we are, um, during the investigation, we, we, during the investigation, we go, because we had to do a lot of work, work in, on field, we realized that a safe, a safe space, well, most of the most of the CPP person realized that a safe space can be a, just a bad room. It's simple. I, there's been that, that simple that access to a bad room in a, in a in a mall or, or or in a restaurant it's, it's sometimes we see that like the big things but don't pay attention to the small things or the details that actually create the entire experience or about safety in those spaces just want to add that uh, Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. I think, you know, fundamentally that those kinds of safer spaces aren't, you know, incommensurable with sort of broader inclusivity or, you know, like broader, you know, um, um, a future vision of like, you know, people, a lot of folks being included. But I do think that, you know, there are times when making spaces safer for folks doesn't mean making everyone always feel included, right? And that there are priorities and you need to sort of figure out who who is the space for and how are you serving them with the space rather than you know sort of this general idea of like oh everyone we should want everyone to feel welcome um because when every like sometimes i think the desire to make everyone feel welcome often actually takes attention from you know do the folks who historically have not felt welcome in most spaces in a particular field feel welcome here but then I'm super curious as to your thoughts. I was just mostly thinking about what you said, and I was just wondering if, uh, you know, in relation to that, uh, this, this thing that I mentioned about making a process seamless, you know, as a goal in a way, would it be possible to make it seamless to the ones who do truly need it, you know, to take away that sort of, I wouldn't like to say burden, but you know, you have to go through this process again to, you know, so taking that out for those people, but to the ones who have not experienced those things, you know, to make them visible in a way. So sort of meeting halfway, does that make sense? I do think that I really like what, what you said, Berlin, and I think that it kind of uh, makes sense with what Kendra said as to when we were talking about, for me, like the conclusion of this is like when we're talking about safe spaces, if we do have to think about who do we want to make uh, feel welcome and safe in, in a space. And that sometimes the reality is that sometimes the, those, the, those groups are, the needs of, of certain groups are, are not gonna, um, come together are not going to be seamless and that's just part of of reality and in a way i think that for me what i 
got from this is like creating a safe space for for when we create a safe space for for trans and non-binary for folks it's kind of interesting to make the process for them seamless and maybe just try to make it more like educational for other for other people because well me as a, as a cis person i'm used to things being seamless and it's interesting for me to to experience uh, uh, places where where it's just not like that and just to to empathize more with what other communities are going through i think that's really valuable in in this stage of humanity i think and sorry for my, my camera my my connection is kind of it's kind of off so don't worry it's okay well uh if kendra want to share something else is you can do it now or i can make another question <laughs> okay so um right now we live in in a world that we share a lot of information or a lot of what we are or, or identities online so how we create safe spaces online thinking in gender as a main issue and thinking as a being trans or non-binary well for me i think that the first thing that we have to take into account is that well the well the reality right now is that we have these um, in online sp in spaces, we have very specific spaces that we're habitating, right? So we are, um, we're using Facebook, we're using Twitter, we're using Instagram mostly. And I think that I'm, my, 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 think, my thinking process is going to go to how do we build, how are those spaces built? Like those spaces are, are almost mandatory for most of us because we don't only like, uh, like social media is not only for leisure right now. It's about, it, it has a lot to do with our identity, with our work. Some of us work online and have to share our vision and our experiences online for, for many purposes. And I think that's one of the main things that we, we talk a lot about in, in, in TEDIC is, is about how technology is never neutral. Like these spaces are never neutral. They're built by people, with, by people who have their own biases, their own ideas of uh, how these spaces should be built. And they have certain people in mind that they're building these spaces for. And for us, we always talk about the like the glass ceiling for 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 women and and non-binary and trans folks. Like it's very hard for 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 us and for for gender for gen, the diver, diversity folks to um, be in a position of making decisions about how these these spaces are being built. So I so I think that's um, like. Uh, it's very important for us to talk about how do we how do we get more people from diverse people from uh, diverse genders and races and nationalities and cultures to actually part participate in the in how these spaces are being built and I think that that's one of the the main issues that we that that uh, technology enterprises are uh, should be facing right now to build these kinds of spaces. I don't know if anyone else wants to share. I would like to share something in terms of infrastructure as well, given that we've been talking about you know, Kendra, you gave this example, you know, when you enter into an event and you have, you know, the option of like the name tags and stuff, um, but then the bathrooms <laughs> are an obstacle in that sense. So um, I would say that when it comes to technology, you know, the infrastructure also plays a big role. And it's, uh, of course, we know that um, there are groups that face more instances of violence, 
and, uh, and threats online, but also how are these platforms built in such a way that they also represent like these obstacles. For example, um, I, I've also worked at TEDIC before coming here. So then, then from TEDIC, we saw that uh, the trans community at home in Paraguay faced many instances in which they had to create new Facebook accounts. That's the social media platform that they use the most, but they had to create it really often given the amount of attacks that they received from people and the coordinated attacks in many cases, right? Reporting their profiles as fake ones and, and things like that. But there's one specific case that made us think in levels of infrastructure um, of a trans activist here, like there in Paraguay. Sorry, I'm not in Paraguay anymore, but in my head I am. Uh, so this trans uh, activist, her name is Irene Rotella. So uh, she contacted us because she, she told us that um, her account got uh, reported again and she wanted to get it back. And in order to get it back, she, has, she had to follow through all of these steps to verify her identity and everything. And one of them was to take, to show a picture of her ID. And her ID has, you know, the, um, how would you say in English, sorry, the, her gender her, identity her, assigned her at, uh, at birth, right? So um, that didn't coincide with the one she has now and, or the one she identifies with. So those mechanisms that are thought by programmers and developers should also take into account these nuances that may take place, and especially given that trans and non-binary folks experience such degrees of attacks and threats online very often, you know. So um, that's something that came to my head that I wanted to mention in levels of infrastructure as well. I do think that just to uh, piggyback on that, something else that we were seeing, especially when the pandemic started, was that we well we work very closely with this with. Irene and her community, her community is called Casa Diversa. And something that she mentioned to us was that when the pandemic, when the pandemic started, um, well, the uh, something that, that you should know is that in Paraguay, like trans rights are almost not in, non existent and most um, trans folks just have a lot of uh, are, are part of uh, a lot of other groups uh, vulnerable groups like um, they uh, some most of the girls in that uh, that come to Casa Diversa and that work with it and maybe don't know how to read the most uh, folks in the most trans transgender folks in in Paraguay uh, work in the sex industry they they're they work in, in those kind of stuff. And they, for, for them, it was like, they were like in a very, uh, in an, a very big emergency situ situation because they had, they were in lockdown. So they, they weren't able to go to the street and work. So they had to come up with new ways of working and every, all the work, working activity uh, just became on, uh, just started to be fully online. So you had this uh, these very large group of, of people who didn't have access to, to cell phones, who uh, sometimes didn't know how to operate a cell phone or, or didn't know how to read. And they had to maybe build an online uh, like platform for to, to, just to continue to work. And they started receiving attacks because, their work, the, like, because they were doing sexual work and sexual work is deemed incorrect and wrong by our society. So they were kind of trapped. They were kind of trapped in this situation where they couldn't go to the street, they couldn't go online, they couldn't go anywhere. So, and maybe they, they could use other platforms like, I don't know, like uh, OnlyFans or maybe Twitter even has some mechanisms that allow you to share uh, your, your pictures and stuff like that to promote your work. But they weren't able to to go to those solutions to to find those solutions because they just uh, their education level didn't allow them to to access these platforms. And for us, they, this gave us a lot of questions about why are these uh, could these platforms be uh, designed in a way that were more accessible to people who didn't speak English, who didn't know how to uh, didn't were like. Uh, they were having trouble reading. So for us, it's like a problem with uh, a lot of uh, 
different uh, very very different and complex act aspects and I think that um, no one was taking that into account when the, the pandemic started. And I think that there's like in the spectrum of human experiences, these kind of uh, these kinds of issues are taking place all of the time with very different characteristics. And um, yeah, for us, that was uh, like a very eye opening situation that we that, that we found with with these girls. Right. So I just wanted to share that. And I don't know if Kendra wants to share something. Yeah, no, actually you, you that really uh, ties into what I was gonna say. So thank you so much for, for sharing that story. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's sort of like, I see like this, like sort of thinking about trans and non-binary inclusion and gender inclusion more broadly in online spaces as having sort of two, there's sort of like, two sets of problems, like only two, just two. Uh, but uh, the one is, right, you know, the lack of, um, you know, inclusive design in the larger major platforms, right, you know, in terms of, you know, stuff like having to verify your identity or like it not them not being accessible to, well, accessible to folks with disabilities or accessible to folks with who uh, aren't super comfortable reading, you know, like, uh, are not accessible in a variety of different uh, aspects. And when I think about trans and non-binary folks in particular, there's this amazing um, piece of scholarship and I'll drop a link in after um, by this woman named Rena Bivens who wrote about how when Facebook and probably everyone here already is familiar with this, but when Facebook changed their you know, gender options on, on Facebook. So you could, there was that whole list of like 35 identities or whatever. It really pissed off a lot of conservatives um, in the United States, but the underlying it, they'd never changed the underlying ad advertising logic. So the underlying advertising logic was still sorting you into one of two buckets, male or female. So it didn't really matter if you told Facebook, like, I'm non-binary or I'm gender fluid or, you know, I, you know, I'm two-spirit or any of these sort of uh, gender identities. It would sort of just still put you in one of these, like, this underlying binary logic. So I, I see that as, like, one set of problems, right, with the, like, lack of inclusion and, like, thoughtful design on the major uh, the major platforms. But I think one thing that I, I think that can be tricky is certainly there are spaces where I feel safer online. And if I think about those, there are often spaces where I have exactly as Balin said, like more control, more there, um, I think Fernando said more control and Balin said consent, right? Like there's, there's a, a set of norms, but often those are spaces that I can control because I have a fair amount of technological know-how, time, and potentially money, right? So I may feel safer with my colleagues, my friends who I talk to in my signal chats, but when I work with sex workers on the ground in Holyoke, Massachusetts, they're not on signal. We're at like, we, we chat on text message because like, the, if, and if I refuse to not speak with them unless we were on signal, like I wouldn't work with them, right? Um, and the same thing actually is true, uh, Fernanda, uh, with what you were talking about, about sort of folks trying to get online for sex work, because I, so I do a lot of sex worker activism in the United States. And one sort of thing that has been this like constant kind of conversation or battle within like certain aspects of sex worker advocacy has been, there's this thing called Switter, uh, S-W-I-T-T-E-R, uh, which is sex worker Twitter, right? Uh, you know, which that's great, except if you're a sex worker, you do wanna to talk to other sex workers, right? But also like, you wanna be where the clients are, like if you're doing advertising and the clients are for the most part, not on sex worker Twitter, right? So I think, you know, there becomes this problem of if folks who are um, uh, in a minority or excluded or marginalized or sort of forced onto their own platforms, even if they're more inclusive or more, they feel more, they are more in more control or have more power, um, that may very much limit their opportunities um, with regards to the sort of broader world, right? And also, you know, I have a amazing colleague, um, Afsana Ragot, who studies how queer and trans users in, in the Middle East and North Africa use dating apps. 
And basically what happens in the Middle East and North Africa is uh, you don't want to use grinder if you're a gay man in Egypt because the like the police are basically trying to catch people on grinder. So folks end up switching to smaller apps and there's a variety of different anti-surveillance mechanisms folks use. And I will, I'll drop a link to Afsana's work because it's really good in a chat. But I, I think for me, uh, there seems to be, you know, you need both. You need both smaller, more dedicated spaces where folks are able to kind of have control over what they're doing, but also you can't give up on the larger spaces because for better or worse, that's where you interact with, you know, uh, um, other people. Those are, yeah, those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you to everyone. Um, and well, I think we took a really little about everything, uh, but I, what is, and I think we're running out of time too. Yes, we're running out of time. <laughs> Just, you want to share some final consideration or conclusions about it, and you are free to say whatever you wanted to say. We we'll start to share some <laughs> Well, until now we understand that the getting safe spaces actually is more difficult than uh, that we think because never going we're going to have a, a space that is for everyone that is safe that's safe for everyone and no even online or, or offline both imply a design question design imply really be this really be designing designing questions because uh, that need to be addressed that is not about the uh, list of a chatbot of a serial things to to feel is more complex than that create a safe space must include all the time the person that is going to be in that space and for that we need we need to have if you ask me a uh, at uh, this uh morning uh the uh inclusion by design from the yeah from uh, from the beginning you had to be with the people that are actually going to use the space uh, my experience in doing the the for trans people uh well I, what i'm talking about if i'm uh, if i wasn't trans <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yes <laughs> doing the uh, for my faults for trans people so uh was like was that was to was was really wide opening because was the was starting the moment that I was being discovering that I was non-binary. Then my experience as non-binary is totally different from the others because I'm black and I'm from Latin America. So it's particular. And the, the experience that they live in, in Argentina, even in, in Latin America, aren't the same that I live in, in Colombia. And for them, the experience of being trans is, it has similar similarities to mine, but, um, but aren't the same in the fact, uh, in, 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 in the end. In the end, and we discovered that we need to work from the beginning, especially to understand why the people consider it safe, because it's not the same thing when you think without the people that is going to be used the technology. Yeah, that is, that's where I want to conclude. If anyone wants to share something else. Please go ahead. Um, maybe I can share. Well, for me, uh, like 
I think that the message that I wanna that I wanna share is very similar to what you said, uh, Juan, in specifically about um, well, when building safe spaces. I think that well, when building any kind of space as big as a as a platform, maybe. So when we're talking about big platforms, small platforms, um, I think that it, uh, it's just really important to to have a very diverse team that has power of decision, right? So, so I think that the creation of a, like the creation of a, a, a like a better Facebook, like an ideal Facebook, would, uh, should be filled with a lot of debate, should be filled with a lot of voices, a lot of uh, disconsent, um, and with fighting. I think that that is very valuable, and I think that um, just including more of these people. Uh, for uh, in the design is just it's just something that we have to uh, advance to like that I think that that should be the future of design in these these kinds of platforms and I and I do want to mention because I do work with well the the trans communities that that I particularly usually work with are uh, are are not only the, the the only like vulnerability that they have is not about their gender it's about a lot of other things about their economic level about their language level about uh, different stuff. I think that we should recognize that we are all very different. Like, like these kinds of platform, Facebooks and stuff like that, um, are universal. But at the same time, they're really not. They're really not. They're designed by a certain, cer a certain type of people. And if we wanna, and, and we do have to fight for if if a platform is going to be this big and it's going to um, like take control of our lives, we should be. Uh, we should be in the debate on how it is built. And I think that that, that work is very important it, and it is to be done, but I think that the, the generation of these kinds of spaces of communication, the inclusion of, of, of different people in these kinds of conversation is the, it's like the, the start of, of what we should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. I do agree with uh, what you said, uh, Juan, about thinking of safety and inclusion from the very beginning and not just like as an afterthought, <laughs> after like the basis of things are, you know, laid out. Oh, yeah, now we need to, you know, um, I do agree like it has to be included from the very beginning. And I also think that intersectionality plays a big role in here as well. Uh, so when we look at things from an intersectional lens, we to get to include the different nuances that come along with the different identities that we have as people, right? Our sexuality, gender, race, culture, and other aspects are interrelated and different power dynamics and also, you know, different types of privilege uh, come at play depending on that. So that's also very um, important as well to take into consideration. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everybody, what everyone has said so far. Uh, I think the, the thing maybe I'll sort of offer in closing is I think that um, that it can, there's something tempting about doing design, being like, oh, we're gonna have folks included at the beginning from the beginning and there'll be a participatory design process without really ever engaging with questions of like power or control or credit or money. And like that to me is like the big sort of like, uh, this is awkward, but you know, like, you know, which is that especially, you know, sort of large, like, you know, a company like Facebook or, you know, large American US companies, they like, I think often underestimate the degree to which it sounds silly, but no, like it turns out they're not on equal footing with activists, right? Like, you know, and that like, there's always gonna be questions about that folks are gonna have about how far can I push or like, what can I ask for or what's reasonable? And, you know, the only way I know how to do that work in the long term that I think really actually pays off is like really deep time and energy into like building commu like community, like individual relationships, right? To the point where you know the folks that are in conversation like they're you know this isn't like there's a level of trust and actual belief that you know that they're not going to sever the partnership if you say something they don't like or 
you know, they're not going to pitch a grant that's re that requires using a technology that nobody cares about. And it, we're all people are just going to pretend that actually what they don't, they just like, you see all the time that like people want to pitch like some sexy new technology to activists um, around trans inclusion. And it's like, no, you just need a WordPress site. Like, you know, like this is not complicated. Right. And so I think part of it also, it feels important to me to also just think about, you know, what are we asking for from the folks we're including in these systems and like what what are we you know what are what's being given in return and how those relationships are what whether and how those relationships are built what to last or to not last um because i think otherwise the there's a real worry around sort of very extractive design relationships where it's sort of like we're going to come in and build you a thing and then you'll never hear from us again except when we take lots of pictures of your ethnically diverse group of people so that we look good right i don't know i, I now i just got on a tangent so i'm going to close there by saying that like i think that these questions are questions about inclusion and designing for inclusion in online spaces and offline spaces are not separable from questions of like power and money and influence um and that it you know we should probably be paying more attention to, or at least I think I have started to produce better work as I've paid more attention to those. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. And really, I really enjoyed this conversation, I have to say. Yeah, it was something I think we all need to hear because we actually don't see so, so much in in this kind of dance, especially when we were in technology. So really, 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 thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you guys thank for you. the space. Yeah. So where Thank you, you Queer and AI.